Okay, so today we're going to keep on with geometry. We've pretty much done with volume, I think. So we're going to hop on over 6.2, which is more volume. And we're going to look at arc lengths. And I kept arc lengths where I didn't keep surface area because it's very easy to imagine real world situations where you have a path and you want to know how long it is. I mean, basically any time you go driving, let's say, I mean, your distance to your destination, if you're driving along kind of curved roads, isn't going to be the distance as the crow flies. It's not going to be that. It's going to be the length of a curve, the length of an arc. So, Naturally, we're interested in being able to find such a length. And in the real world, there are complications you have to deal with. You know, what if the cur what if the road, what if the road you're driving on is doing something like this? Well, this isn't a function, and we're only working with functions at the moment. We'll see at the very end of the class, like maybe literally the last section, we'll see how to deal with that. But for now, let's say we have some curve, y equals f of x. We start at a and wind up at b, and we want to know the length of that curve. The derivation of this form to the, the derivation of the length form to the is a little um, intricate, but it's interesting. I mean, maybe, well, maybe interesting is pushing it, but it shows how the mean value theorem can sometimes show up in the wild and be used in totally unexpected ways. So it's interesting in that sense. So before we do anything else, let's remind ourselves the mean value theorem says that if you have some curve Let's call this point xi, yi, and this point xi plus one, comma y, i plus one. Then for some c in between the x's, the derivative at c is equal to the average rate of change of the interval. And we need some stuff to be true. We need, um, we need the function to be continuous. We need the function to be differentiable. But um, 
for the functions whose arc lengths we're trying to find, they will be continuous and differentiable. So I'm not stressed about that. I am going to rewrite to this slightly, just because writing these x sub i plus ones and y sub i's and so on gets kind of old. Let's call the horizontal distance here delta x sub i. And the vertical distance, delta y sub i. We might have, I'm trying to remember, because that semester was so weird, we might have sort of skimmed over this. But delta usually represents change in calculus. So the idea is we start here and we wind up here and our X coordinate changes and our Y coordinate changes. And this delta X is telling us how much our X coordinate changes. And this delta Y is telling us how much our Y coordinate changes. Then the statement becomes the significantly quicker to write down statement that f prime of c is delta y over delta x. And although this is the way the mean value theorem is normally written, You can multiply both sides by the delta x to get this statement. And looking ahead a bit, but those delta x's and delta y's, um, I said they usually represent change. In fact, we've seen them this very semester when we're talking about Riemann sums. A Riemann sum should have a delta x in it. This is one of these things where the basic idea of what we're doing is the easiest thing in the world, and then actually doing it requires a little, um, a little messing around. I've said this before, and I'll no doubt say it again. The process of calculus is basically the process of taking approximations and making them exact using limits. So our goal, if we want the length of that curve, should be to approximate the length of the curve and then see if we can make our approximation better. And if our approximation happens to have a delta x in it, then this is probably going to give us some kind of limit. We'll take a limit as delta x goes to zero and get an integral. So as I say, the process is clear enough. And we'll start with something we've done many a time in this class. We'll take the interval we're looking at and we'll cut it into pieces. And then we'll look at one of these pieces and we'll say, well, on this piece, We can create a straight line, and the curve looks a whole lot like that straight line.
then we create the straight line. The curve looks a lot like that straight line. We going with these straight lines. And these straight lines seem to be doing a pretty good job of following the curve. And the lengths of the straight lines therefore ought to be pretty close to the length of the curve. Not exactly but at this stage, we're only trying to approximate. The length of the curve will come later. I mean, the exactness will come later. And the reason this is a good idea, I mean, it's easy to say, oh, we'll approximate it. But what makes this a good idea is that we can find these lengths. I mean, the point is to approximate it and be able to find the approximation. We know, at least in theory, how to find the length of a line segment. It's one of those things where maybe it's sort of slipped to the back of our mind because we haven't done it in forever. But it is material we've seen before. So we can find the lengths of each of these line segments, and we can add those lengths up, and our approximation will be a sum. And now we're sort of seeing stuff we've seen before, presumably we'll take a limit and that sum will be a Riemann sum. And we're going to wind up with some kind of integral. Everyone following along so far. Well, there's kind of a hitch though. And this hitch will be solved using the mean value theorem, which is why I took the time to, to remind us of it. The length of this line segment, called L sub i, is the square root of delta x sub i squared plus delta y sub i squared. Um, you may not have seen this form to the written quite like this before, but I'm not doing anything fancy here. I'm using the Pythagorean theorem. The Pythagorean theorem says the hypotenuse squared is delta x squared plus delta y squared. And then because I don't want L squared, I just want L, I took I took the square root of both sides. Writing this very quickly without worrying about the subscripts, there's the Pythagorean theorem, and then you take the square root of both sides. Good so far, but then we come crashing into the following issue. When we take these approximations and we add them all up, we get a sum, but that sum is not a Riemann sum.
a Riemann sum isn't just a bunch of stuff added together. A Riemann sum has a particular form. It's a bunch of stuff added together where all of the things we're adding together are being multiplied by delta x. Well, this is not what we have. We're adding these square roots together. We do have a delta x, but it's stuck inside the square root. And now here is where we are going to hit this thing with the mean value theorem. We are going to take that equation and we are going to replace delta y with that thing that delta y is equal to. We get the square root of delta x sub i squared plus f prime of c sub i star times delta x sub i. So I'm taking delta y, and delta y is equal to this, and delta y is being squared, so that whole thing is being squared. And now we're taking a bunch of things that look like this and adding them together. And uh, so much writing down, but you may sort of see, see the light at the end of the tunnel here. We've got this delta x sub i squared. It's under a square root. We want to just have delta x, no square root. Well, what's ultimately going to happen is that the square and the square root will cancel each other out and just leave us with what we want. And this is, this is a long road, I might say, to what's ultimately going to be a quite simple looking formula. Um, we have, well, actually, does anybody have any thoughts on where we could go from here? We want to get the delta x sub i squared out of the square root. We have two delta x sub i squares. They're being added together. Well, the square root of a product is easy to deal with. It's the product of the square roots. Any way to turn this addition into a product? You just boil it out pretty much or multiply. Um, I'm not sure there's stuff you can exactly foil here because you don't have some is added together. Kind of the opposite of foiling. You got the delta x sub i squared and then have it multiplied by one plus f prime of c i star I squared. That is exactly correct. Thank you. We can 
pull out this common term, and that will leave us with one plus the derivative. And now uh, one plus the derivative squared. And now the product of the square root is the square root of the product. Yes, that is what I meant to say. These, uh, I mean, technically the square root of a square is an absolute value. But delta xi is the side of a triangle, it's positive. And the absolute value of a positive number, you don't need the symbols. So we take these sums and we add them all together. We can assume these delta x's are all the same um, because the delta x's are determined by how we cut the interval up and we decide how to cut the interval up. Way back here, I can say, and in fact, I did say, okay, let's cut it up so all of those intervals are the same length. And this sum, this, let me use L for length, this is still an approximation. A squiggly equal sign means approximately equal to the sum. I tend to get a little sloppy with my summation notation. We have however many intervals we have. The square root of one plus f prime of, I normally use x sub i, but I won't, x sub i star, but I won't change it this late in the day. We'll assume that all of our delta x sub i's are the same, and we can just write delta x. And now you know the drill, or at least you've seen the drill. This length is approximated by a Riemann sum. To go from an approximation to an exact value, we'll take a limit as this delta x goes to zero. And we'll get the length is the interval from A to B, the square root of one plus the derivative squared dx. That is the arc length formula. Now, 99 times out of 100, probably more than 99 times out of 100, you are not going to be able to find this integral by hand. But again, that's fine. I mean, I think our textbook is a little stagnant. It has one section that kind of briefly talks about technology, but the reality is that most integrals you cannot find by hand. That isn't some great problem. It just means you use technology to approximate it. 
And if your answer is like equal or correct up to the up to the 16th decimal place, well, that's a pretty good answer. Whether you want to say it's a numerical approximation or not, I guess it's not a whether or not, it is a numerical approximation. Mm -hmm. But it would be such a good one that no one's going to stress over it. Um, the reason that 99 times out of 100, you are not going to be able to take the integral by hand, is that this is something that should be U substitution, but is almost never going to be. You have composition, you have something under the square root, This is the kind of thing you should do or attempt using U substitution, but there's nothing outside of the square root to that to, to be a du. There is no chance that you're going to have the derivative of this thing floating around. So I mean we can see that's that's I mean, we won't make our life intentionally difficult. In fact, let's make our first example even easier than that. Writing the wrong things. y equals x squared on the interval from zero to one. And let's try to find the arc length. <clears throat> well, to find the arc length, we're going to need the derivative. Uh, in particular, the derivative square shows up in the formula. And the arc length is the integral from zero to one of the square root of one plus the derivative squared dx. And at least at this point in our career, there's nothing anyone can do with this. We've got an outside and an inside function. If it's anything, it ought to be u substitution. But to do a U substitution, we need an X floating around. And we do not have an X floating around, so we can't do this. Um, this is actually an integral we'll learn to take. It's not a very fun integral to take. But um, that won't be for some weeks. As I say, though, it's, it's possible to get a little precious about this. You can go to any sort of computer algebra system. I use the one that is free and online, and I'll ask it for the integral from zero to one of the square root of one plus four x squared dx. And it will give us one 
But when I said, oh, they'll actually learn to do this later, you see, but the relevant thing is that we get the answer numerically 1.478. 9428575 and i mean this might might just be a numerical approximation but it's hard to imagine an application where that is not accurate enough for our purposes uh just sort of making something up. I mean, if, if things didn't work out with x squared, you can probably imagine they're not going to work out with more complicated uh, functions. So what you see a lot in homework and tests and so on is set up, but do not evaluate. The integral representing the length of this curve. So we just sort of acknowledge, okay, you're gonna get an integral, you're probably not gonna be able to do anything with it. And um, really, this is then a calculus exercise because the what a silly thing to say in a calculus class. Really, this is a calculus one exercise. We need to be able to take the derivative of that. Afterwards, we'll just take it and plug it into the formula. So remember that the sine squared of x is the sine of x squared. So when we take the derivative of this, we're going to have to use the chain rule. We've got an inside and an outside function. And as for the derivative, you know, the derivative of x is one. We take the derivative of the outside function, so the power comes down and the power is reduced by one. But then we've got this link in the chain. We have to multiply by the derivative of that inside function. And the derivative of the sine is the cosine. And there is the derivative And then the arc length is the integral from, let me remind myself, from zero to pi of the square root of one plus this derivative
squared. And we could, I mean, we could foil that out. I, I don't really think it's going to help. Um, one plus one is two. And here's the integral set up, but not evaluated. Uh, in the last problem, when I got to the integral, I was like, oh, actually, I do kind of know how to do it. Here, I have no idea. It might be possible to do by hand if you use just the right trick in just the right way, but I could not take this integral if, if my life depended on it. Again, 10. Get the numerical approximation. You. Integral from zero to pi of pi of square root two plus four sine x cosine x. plus four sine of x squared, cosine of x squared, close that square root and hopefully Oof, I'm alpha, no, not now, make a fool of me. Okay, there we go. Wolfram Alpha doesn't know how to take this integral by hand, as it were, either. Um, but it can give us a numerical approximation, 4.75379. And that was, I mean, the, the actual problem, as it was stated, was not, where did it go, was not to get the numerical <laughs> approximation. The problem, as stated, let's do, was to set up the integral. And we have done that there. All right, slightly early, but I'm going to let you go here. That's all there is in this section. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to do a kind of weird, we're going to do a limit section material you might have thought we left behind us. And then we're going to start taking integrals in earnest.